the Rose Bowl Stadium in Pasadena, California. It is Super Bowl XI. This is Bill King with a welcome. Everything in the United States, everything really in a sports sense in the world, is zeroed in, focused today here in the canyon at Arroyo Seco. This 11th Super Bowl will be viewed in 41 nations around the world. Desde el Tazón de las Rosas en Pasadena, California, los Raiders de Oakland y Vikingos de Minnesota se enfrentan en el Super Tazón número 11. The Raiders, Oakland, champion de la Conference Americana, y los Vikings de Minnesota, champion de la Conference Nacional. C'est la confrontation tant attendue entre Francis Tarkenton des Vikings et Ken Stabler des Raiders. As my leader, Curtis Cowboy Gowdy out of Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Jeff and Hazel's baby boy sit at the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains, rising a little over a mile, the snow-covered mountains, and the fall foliage is drifting slowly down to the base of this Rose Bowl here in Pasadena. We are about to bring to you the 11th Super Sunday Super Bowl. Super Bowl XI offered a classic conflict. Pro football's two most successful teams in a final struggle for the most treasured victory in the game. Neither the Raiders nor the Vikings had ever won a Super Bowl. But over the last 10 years, they have been the most consistent winners in the National Football League. The Raiders, a team built by Al Davis and coached by John Madden, have won divisional titles in nine of the last ten years. The Vikings, coached by Bud Grant, have played in more Super Bowls than any team in history. In the opening minutes of the game, both teams probed and tested one another piecing together bits of strategy in search of a successful pattern. The contest was a standoff until late in the first quarter when the Raiders were forced to punt. One man behind the line of scrimmage on the rush. Here comes the kick! It is blocked! It was a golden opportunity for Minnesota. But the Vikings, just one yard from the goal line, never got there. Brent McClanahan fumbled. Willie Hall, number 39, recovered the ball for Oakland. The Vikings lost the initiative. Now the Raiders would seize it. Oakland launched its counterattack with a play that would be a harbinger of bad times for Minnesota. Clarence Davis ran left for a 35-yard gain. Quarterback Ken Stabler moved the Raiders across midfield with two passes to Dave Casper, Oakland's leading receiver in 1976. Casper was once an offensive tackle for Notre Dame. Now, as a tight end, he is the power gear in Oakland's freewheeling pass offense. Casper's second reception put the Raiders in position for the first score of the game. Field goal, snap, spot, kick on the way. That one's good, and the Raiders climbing it on the board. Scoreboard goes up with three, Minnesota nothing. The Raiders had marched 90 yards in 12 plays. 
Although they were stopped short of a touchdown, they had moved smartly through every avenue of their game plan. The next time they had the ball, they would take the same road. Only this time, it would lead them to the land of six. When the Raiders regained possession of the ball, they continued to run to their left. This strategy succeeded because of Oakland's ability to dominate the right side of the Viking defense, which consists of Alan Page, Jim Marshall, and number 58, corner linebacker Wally Hilgenberg. Guard Gene Upshaw pushed Page to the inside. Tackle Art Shell shoved Marshall to the outside. And when Hilgenberg came up to fill the hole, he was removed by Mark Van Egan. Clarence Davis, number 28, gained 137 yards in the Super Bowl. 105 of them came on variations of this play. The secret of its success was not only the powerful blocking of Upshaw and Shell, but also the blocking of running back Mark Van Egan, who neutralized the corner linebacker and gave Davis room to run. Hilgenberg has been a linebacker in the NFL for 13 years. But in spite of his experience and skill, he could not avoid the battering blocks of Van Egan. During the regular season, Van Egan had gained twice as much yardage as Davis, but in this Super Bowl, he was more valuable to his team as a blocker. With Van Egan hitting out on Minnesota's corner linebackers, the other Oakland running backs were able to turn upfield for solid gains. Three carries by Call Garrett, number 31, moved the Raiders to the Viking six. With Minnesota expecting another run, Stabler surprised them with a perfectly thrown sideline pass to Fred Beletnikov, who touched down at the one-yard line. On the next play, the Raiders resumed their attack on Minnesota's right side. But instead of plowing through it, they sailed over it on an easy pass from Ken Stabler to Dave Casper. Holy Toledo! The Oakland line is just wiping out Minnesota's front. Already, Bill, on that left side, they're going to Marshall and Hilgenberg, two older players, not very big and seemingly not very strong in the early going. With five minutes to play in the second period, the Raiders marched to their second touchdown. The key play in this drive was a 17-yard pass to Fred Beletnikov. First and goal on the half-yard line. Here's the power formation right side. Hand off to Banizak. He powers over. Touchdown, Raiders! Joshua Heifetz never played a violin with more dexterity than Kenny Stabler is playing the Minnesota Viking defense this afternoon in the Rose Bowl Stadium in Pasadena. The Raiders' domination of the first half was reflected not only in the score, but also in the man-to-man -man matchups that as much as any one thing often decide the outcome of a game. Big reason for the success of Oakland's running game was the way Art Shell, number 78, consistently eliminated Jim Marshall. Shell was so overpowering that Marshall did not make a tackle the whole game. Center Dave Dalby engaged middle linebacker Jeff Seaman, number 50, in another matchup that often ended in Oakland's favor. 
Dalby disrupted Seaman's angle of pursuit. Then shoved him into the backwash of Oakland's churning ground attack. While Dalby and Shell won their battles at the scrimmage line, Fred Boletnikoff was winning another in the open field of the secondary. Nate Wright, number 43, had been given the unenviable task of trying to cover Boletnikoff. As might be expected, he did not fare well. Both of Oakland's touchdowns were set up by passes to Boletnikoff. The most dangerous receiver in Minnesota's passing attack is Sammy White, number 85. White led the NFC with 10 touchdown catches, but Skip Thomas, number 26, guarded White so closely that he did not catch a single pass in the first half. The Raiders used not one man, but 11 to stop Minnesota's mighty running back, Chuck Foreman, number 44. Viking fans had hoped to see some of the magic Foreman had displayed all season when he led Minnesota in rushing, receiving, and touchdowns. But today, there was only one moment of magic, and that was this catch and run that gained 26 yards. only escape from the clutches of John Madden's determined defenders who permitted him only 42 yards rushing for the entire game. With Foreman unable to run with the ball and White unable to catch it, Minnesota's offense was on the verge of extinction. In the third quarter, the Vikings fell further behind. A Raider field goal made it 19 to nothing. If there was fire in the ashes of the Vikings' hopes, quarterback Fran Talkington was now the only person who could change the flicker to a flame. Throwing passes on almost every play, Talkington moved his team 68 yards in 13 plays to their first touchdown of the game. Chuck Foreman and Ahmad Rashad, number 28, made key receptions in the drive. Sammy White made his first catch of the day, and it was good for a touchdown. The touchdown roused the Viking defense for the first time in the game, Stabler lost yard. As the final period began, Talkington resumed his passing attack. But this time the Raiders were ready and plays that had worked earlier were no good at all now. Without a running attack and needing two touchdowns to win, Tarkington had to pass against a defense that had no reason to play him honest. The Raiders' rush, though formidable, posed no unusual problem for Tarkington. The real dangers lurked in the secondary. Back to 
pass goes tucking it. He's going down the middle, and White makes the catch. He is clean, but holds on to the football, losing the helmet. Chin strap flying one way, helmet the other. Holy Toledo. With four linebackers and four defensive backs, the Raiders surrounded and terrorized Talkington's receivers. Oakland eliminated Talkington's targets, narrowed his field to fire, and finally proved the undoing of everything he had hoped to Harkin accomplish. Back to pass on third. The rush by Hendricks peels him out of there to the left. He's back pedaling and throwing. Intercepted by Willie Hall at the 30. Back to the 40. Runs into traffic. Raider football. He's brought down at the 46-yard line. The Raiders now had a choice of two plans. They could fence and parry to protect their lead, or they could attack to destroy and demolish. The 48-yard pass to Fred Boletnikoff put the Raiders two yards away from a touchdown that would end the competitive phase of Super Bowl XI. Here's the snap. Give the ball to Banaszak. He powers over. Touchdown, Raiders! Vikings trail by 19 points and the remaining seven minutes of the game became a despairing, hopeless quest for a goal they knew they would never reach. winning more games than any team in the NFL over the last 14 years. The Raiders proved to the whole world something their fans had known for a long, long time. Super Bowl victory for the Oakland Raiders. A victory won not only for this season, but for seasons past. A victory that set a magnificent crown on the Oakland Raiders' unrivaled 14-year reign as football's winningest team.
Stay tuned for more.